Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Tourismus Namibia. Obviously, this time it's on a Sunday as announced last week. And with me today, you've got Irene Marie. Irene Marie, no? Irene Marie van der Waal. Okay, Irene Mary Marie van, van der Waal. Okay, and uh, she's part of the uh, zone team and uh, said she wanted to join me. Is it right? <laughs> I'm not so sure about the wanted, but surely, um, yes, um, like we always said, we want different faces, new ideas. And uh, the moment that uh, Irene Marie uh, will get used to this whole setup, she'll probably just, uh, also share more news and, and find more snippets that she wants to comment on. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I think I, um, I'm going to enjoy my time at Christmas. I think the Namibian landscape runs in our blood. So Yeah, no, it's perfect. So anyway, as normal, we'll have our topics. We'll uh, then present some destinations, holiday ideas, whatever you want to call it. And then finally, we've got to the point. So up next first is topics. then I have the honour of kicking off with our very first topic for today. Mm. Um, firstly, today, the Minister of Environment, Forestry and Tourism, that's Mr. Poamba Shifeta, uh, invited the Algemeine Zeitung team to the Boabuata National Park, where they launched the Wildlife Management and Conservation and Strategies. And he also handed over some equipment to the anti-poaching unit. So right now we're going to show you some videos provided to us by Ms. Leah Dillman. The foundation of sound conservation, conservation system has been established which has allowed the wildlife population to be built. As a result, Namibians have been able to benefit from wildlife and other resources through tourism, conservation, hunting and other uses. The extreme poaching the slaughter that Namibia has experienced over the past decade represents a massive challenge for younger nations like ours. Despite some constraints that we are faced with, we have implemented some countermeasures, including the deployment of security forces in the national parks and other strategies, strategic areas to spearhead wildlife protection in other areas. Management measures and actions were pro pro proposed for inclusion in the National Elephant Conservation and Management <coughs> Plan. Today, we have a document that developed through an extensive stakeholder consultation process that we are all proud of. Namibia has been very successful with wildlife conservation, particularly the conservation of species such as elephants, rhinos and others. As part of the process to develop this National Elephant Conservation and Management Strategy, we have established that elephants have not just increased in numbers, but have also expanded in range. 
that are now found in areas from which they were lo locally extinct more than 40, 50, and 70 years ago. Important document, wildlife corridors of the Zambezi region. You know, this is important because we have been emphasizing this, especially to our traditional communities and their, their leadership. That animal, especially wild animal roads, should be should remain so that um, we allow the passage, the free passage of our wildlife, especially elephants, so that to avoid, in order to reduce or mitigate uh, human wildlife conflict. Human wildlife conflict is now, you know, enhanced because we settle in wildlife corridors. They are normal, traditional migrator roads. In their migrator roads, if you settle there, the elephant will come and ask you, why did you put up this? And the elephant will destroy your property or destroy your, your field. So therefore, we need to make sure that um, we adhere to those measures and the proposals in this uh, document. Thank you very much for that. Now, these are fridges. Um, I operate on solar, and both solar and I think so. And the cord. Feed. Yeah, so, so and uh, mostly those that uh, do not have yeah, I think we'll write about it in the coming days and uh, tell you more about it. But uh, that was obviously up the, you know, actually getting the management plans into gear, something that we'd spoken about and been took for a while now, so it's good to see it's coming, it's finally kicking off up in the north because that's really where the whole management plan needs to come to life. Um, but up next we've got the Okavango River. And uh, so it is, uh, you know, we all worry about our water levels and the water quality as a result of the oil exploration going on. But this actually just, uh, uh, I would say, reiterates the importance of water up there uh, because we are now seriously reminded uh, how quick Namibia suddenly has a, has a problem with water again. This is the Okavango River and its levels are getting very, they're subsiding extremely. So if there's no rain in Angola, it, it will only be a question of time. And so when we already see that so much water is used uh, for, for the basic, just the exploration process, then you need to ask yourself what will happen over time when it comes to the actual oil production, if it ever, hopefully it will never come that uh, far, at least not in terms of fracking. Um, but anyway, so uh, the, the, the biggest danger is not only that it dries out and, and, and there's no water in the, in the Kavango region, but uh, also for the Okavango Delta, which obviously is very important that we have some water there. So we thought we'd just uh, bring you those pictures of Kenya Kambove. He's up in Rundu and uh, he supplied those photos just to illustrate how suddenly these levels are dropping tremendously at this stage. But you've also got another interesting story. Yes, another story also um, to do with that same area. So uh, recently in this week on Thursday, the new Ombudsman of Namibia, Basilias Yakua, mm -hmm. he had his first media press conference, introduced himself to the media, introduced mm -hmm. his aims. Um, and although he largely expressed a heart for the issues left behind by his predecessor that his predecessor John Walters couldn't quite finish. Mm -hmm. um, he also spoke briefly on the Recon Africa issue. So essentially he expressed that the Ombudsman of Namibia doesn't have the financial uh, power to hire an expert to speak into the Recon Africa issue and thus they can't actually fully and properly and impartially investigate this matter so as to make up their minds 
and fully form an opinion on and their stance as the Ombudsman of Namibia. So um, this issue obviously has garnered global attention, famously catching the attention of actor and climate activist Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, and it still remains a very, very hot topic and something that I think Namibians are very worried about. Mm. But at the end of the day, if we can't have institutions like the Ombudsman who can get somebody, an expert, an impartial expert who's not mm. on either side to fully tell us about the possible effects of something, then we can't actually move forward. So the problem right now, or according to the new Ombudsman, is that they can't um, see the the harm that this will do to the environment like physically wow. see it you know like generally when the environment is harmed when there's a mm. fire or something you can go and you can look and you can see okay but these trees have burnt down there has been harm but when it comes to according to him to an underground water source the harm isn't as immediately apparent so mm. they need an expert to really speak into the effects that this could have and they unfortunately don't have the financial strength to be able to do that that must be one of the worst excuses I've ever heard not to do your work. <laughs> because uh, the, the argument is quite simple, mm -hmm. that I am sure that if, if he was now to invite people like uh, Jan Arkert, who's a geologist and an environmentalist, if he was to invite uh, Dr. Roy Miller, who's also a geologist, uh, he was the chief of the Namibian uh, surveying team for years and years, and all those various experts, they would now tell him, obviously, one side of the story. He would quickly see that these people are basing their arguments on fact. Okay? So even if he thinks, no, but they, they're biased, then you get them in. Yeah. They will not cost him a cent because these people are concerned. These people are involved. They're engaged. So all you do is you get their opinions. Yeah. Thereafter, you invite Recon Africa and say, okay, why would you not agree? Why would you say this is not as they say it would be? And then you form your opinion. How, how in your life will you get an unbiased yes. expert? Because yes. any expert is prone to be either on that side or that side. Yeah. So that's why you listen to different arguments and then come to a conclusion. Inform yourself. But to now say, oh, sorry, I don't have the, the money to appoint an expert. That must be the lamest excuse I've ever heard <laughs> of any ombudsman. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm, I'm very honest about yeah. it. Uh, if that is his approach, what he's uh, trying to say is, sorry, I, I'm, I'm not here to do my work. Because, yeah. I mean, th that argument would apply to any number of complaints that yeah. are brought to him. Uh, and he'll always say in the case where he doesn't want to have an opinion, he'll say, oh, sorry, I don't have the money. So mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, it's a very, yeah, very I've also, since I was personally at this press conference mm -hmm. and I spent a lot of time afterwards thinking about what creates bias and at the end of the day, what creates bias is what we believe to be fact and what mm -hmm. we believe to be right Correct, you know yeah. mm -hmm. even if it is a moral point of view and that's why yeah. we have the more or not the more intense but other kinds of debates as well mm -hmm. like abortion it's not that one is right or one is wrong it's that we have differing but opinions. that's why he needs to inform himself and yeah. then arrive at an opinion which he then forwards to the powers that be but to say sorry i don't have the money while yeah. people are prepared to in their own free time tell them what they think, yeah. give them their advice. Many of these people are pensioners who are dead happy to say, based on the experience of 50 years of geology, I can tell you what yeah. is going on. And then obviously he's welcome to invite Recon yeah. Africa because we would love to, them to come forward, but not always with the standard excuse of, but we are, uh, uh, we are doing our thing according to the law. And then only afterwards when something is brought out again, like the water uh, drilling and so on, oh, sorry, but we'll fix it. No, that's not what the EIA is for. Environmental impact assessment, the law that is provided in this country says that you will only get a clearance certificate if you've abided to all those rules. So if time and again you have not abided to those rules, then there must become a point where, in this fact, uh, in, in this uh, case, the MEFT Minister for Amashi Feta must say, guys, this is enough, bring back the clearance certificate, it's being revoked until you've done everything according to law. Mm -hmm. But let's not talk too much about that. Those were our topics. I hope you guys uh, argue at home as much as we love to do it here. <laughs> and uh, up next, it's destinations.
Welcome back. So for our first destination today, we are taking a look at Cups Farm close to Ventuk. Um, if you can see there, it's close to the Cups Farm police station, close to the Zambezi car rental 4x4, which recently won an international award as the best 4x4 car rental. I think we're quite proud of that in Namibia, especially with the focus slowly but surely shifting to self-drive tours in Namibia mm -hmm. in terms of tourism. Um, so you, back to Cups Farm, Yolanda Nell of Vintuk Express paid a visit to Cups Farm. Uh, Cups Farm recently reopened in 2020. So let's have a look at what's going on there. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'm standing here with Anna from Cups Farm. Anna, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Quickly tell us, when did you open? We opened in March 2020 when difficult times started. Uh, me and my husband have safari company. So by that time, everything went dead and we literally collect our last money and open up the farm shop. And quickly tell us what can customers look forward to here? Um, uh, we are basically, our concept is we are supporting local farmers. So all the products that you find here is either made or baked or created by local farmers. Um, uh, farmers that's growing vegetables, baking bread, cookies, making jams, everything that's possible, or doing any crafts that you I will find I here. I see, it's, yes. it's wonderful. And why is it so important to support these locals? Well, uh, in the difficult times, I think it's a great idea to just give a hand to people that just doing small businesses or, you know, doing small stuff just to get in, uh, create extra income for them. Yeah. You also have a cafe where people can come and can have breakfast. Yes. Why is this, why is Cups Farm so important to just get out of town for a little bit? Well, um, it originally came as a, a community bar or community cafe. Uh, we have a great community of people here living at the Finkenstein, Herbots Bleak, uh, Cups Farm itself, um, Keller. So people come and support us uh, in the mornings, usually for a coffee or cake. And lately, people from Windhoek start noticing that there is a great place to sit down. So that's how we open up the cafe and then a lot of Windhoek people coming every weekend. Yeah. And now you just mentioned off camera that you are having the nursery as a permanent feature yes. here. Tell us about that. Um, the idea came last year when we just randomly opened a plant sale. And also the all the small farmers that's growing, some of them tomatoes, some of them succulents or little trees, they all came and bring their stuff here. And uh, it was a big success. So this year we are repeating that. And after a plant sale, we're gonna keep the nursery going. So basically now we have uh, farmers all over Namibia from starting from North, Katima, uh, <laughs> okay, South as well, Ketmansuop, yeah. People bringing their trees, mangoes, all over from Namibia, from Namibia, and yeah, you know, that's how it started. Is this a family-friendly setup? Absolutely. We've got a playground for children. We are dog-friendly. Oh. Um, people celebrating their basically birthdays, mm -hmm. any anniversaries, any uh, baby showers here. So yes, that's great. Anna, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. If you don't know where to go. Saturday, Cups Farm is the place to be. We'll be back shortly. See you. This is good to know because we sometimes do it that we just drive out a bit into the felt mm -hmm. and I didn't even realize that one can quickly pick up a coffee or whatever you do and yeah. then just carry on here along your way. Even if you just drive out to Midgard, you can quickly stop there and That's get something. The yeah. best Sunday you'll ever yeah. have is in the middle of nowhere. Just yeah, a quick exactly. coffee and a black beer cup. Yeah. Anyway, so um, up next, I decided to, to have a look at the route again. Many of you will remember that in the past, I often told you about different alternatives, how you can arrive at your destination. So this week, instead of uh, always coming through uh, Betapos and to Khobabis, which is where my route basically starts, instead of always driving over to, towards the west and, and, and onto Vintuk, and then from there to Achivarongo, what I thought is, why don't you for a change take the route from Khobabis going via Oshinene and Okakarara and then on to Achivarongo. In other words, not always using the same, uh, same roads. And obviously there, there must be many lodges, but uh, I decided to just quickly introduce some of the lodges that you would have 
as you go along that C22 up towards Okakarara. And um, you can see there the time is basically the same, so the travel time doesn't have a huge difference. So the first one I decided to show you is uh, Sandune uh, Game Lodge. I know many people always want to speak of, of Sand Dune. No, it's not Sand Dune, it's Sandune. And it's actually not that far uh, south of Khobabas. And uh, I suppose most of you haven't heard of it yet. Um, as they say on their internet page, uh, they say, uh, it's an experience, one of Namibia's finest luxury uh, safari lodges. The lodge is set on 4,600 uh, hectares in the Kalahari Forest, uh, believe it or not, and it does look like a forest, near Khobabis, and at about 160 k's uh, away from Vintuk International Airport, uh, which isn't really re relevant for what we are trying to do here in, on this trip now. Uh, so it provides the absolute best in luxury, and it has got plenty of game. Uh, at least 20 different species, including oryx, giraffe, impala, zebras and sables, uh, and many more. And uh, the lodge offers on-site and local activities, complemented by world-class cuisine and exceptional hospitality. So, um, as they say on their page, San, uh, Sanduna allows uh, our guests to live out uh, their very own safari dream in a luxury lodge in the heart of Namibia's cattle farming area which is clear, Khobabas is cattle country. Um, Sandune offers 12 spacious rooms and four cottages with daily cleaning services and various outdoor activities such as hiking, game drives and horseback riding. So there's much to do there. And um, so I thought that might be a good idea to start off from there. Obviously, you would go down a bit south from Khobabas, but it's something different, something that we haven't uh, brought up before. So then from there on, I, I decided, okay, now we're really uh, leaving Khobabas in a northerly direction, and we might consider Okatune Ranch. Uh, Okatune, as you can see, it's just uh, sort of northwest of Drimiopsis, uh, which is as you leave uh, Khobabas on the C22. So once again, you just have to veer off the road. I actually worked it out, it's about 20 kilometers away from Drimiopsis. So it's not really that far off your, your route in any case. And um, Okatuna Ranch is, uh, is also on a 6,000 hectare farm. You can see here, this is their brand mark. And uh, I just thought those photos are actually quite nice. It's part of the Khobabas district in the Omaheka region. And it's uh, about 75 kilometers away from Witfle, as you would drive from Windhoek towards uh, Khobabis, halfway or a bit closer to Khobabis, you would have Witfle. And the farm operates as a cattle game and small stock production farm. It's uh, frequently used by corporates for planning sessions and executive retreats uh, and can comfortably accommodate up to 15 guests with uh, its seven double rooms and one family room which are all en suite. So um, this is really about uh, what we had recently, we spoke about it when we said these lodges are not always about just having a luxury lodge. It's about getting that feeling, being mm -hmm. part of the, almost uh, part of the, uh, the farming yeah. operation and experiencing it as it is. So uh, they've even got cycling game, uh, cycling and game walks and shooting and whatever. So um, they, uh, in, they have game which includes giraffe, uh, blue and black villabiest, oryx, kudu, red hartebiest, eland, warthog, waterbuck, zebra, and, and, and in even crocodiles. So um, spending a time there is something different altogether. And then I thought uh, if you leave Khobabas and you don't want to stop that early uh, close to Khobabas, you might try something totally different. Um, and this is the uh, Kaumbangere uh, Cultural uh, Rest Camp. Now this one is uh, just south of Oshinene. Um, Osh so it's still part of the Omaheke region. You can see there on the top of the picture on the left, you will see Ochudunanjupa region starting there. And Ochudunanjupa is obviously that part which takes you along to uh, Okakarara. So Oshinene is about halfway between uh, Khobab is going up to uh, uh, Ochivaronga. And this is something totally different. If you look at the photos that I've, I've uh, taken out, this is their Facebook site. So 
Um, they don't, uh, obviously, this is not a site which you'll find on any tourism uh, uh, organization yet. Um, this is something totally different. I actually liked it. So it's uh, near Oshinene, and um, like I said, and it's a nice little stop halfway uh, along these backwaters, and you drive to, as you drive towards Okakarara. And um, on their Facebook page, you can only read. This peaceful and secure rest camp is an ideal point from which to explore Omaheka and all its attractions. So clearly, um, you know, this is not something for everybody. It's not a luxury lodge, but um, if you will need a shower and a clean bed and that's what you want, then this is different, especially if you take these sort of back roads. Here you can see people actually drove there with a sedan, so it's not as if you are suddenly out in the wilderness and you, you can't reach it with a normal car. Um, so it's, it's something different. Um, if you somebody like me who likes the back roads and not always taking the same routes, this is a nice idea. Now obviously as you leave uh, Oshinene then towards Okakarara, then suddenly there's something for every taste. You can uh, go to Waterberg Plateau Park, you can go to the NWR uh, where you Resort. decide whether you want to camp or live in a luxury lodge. You have all those guest farms in and around that area close to Okakarara. And make no mistake, we've even been to Okakarara um, where there are people who are actually establishing their own uh, little hotels and, and, and pensions and uh, guest houses as well. So we'll look into that uh, sometime uh, and, and, and bring you more of those ideas all around Waterberg and Ochivaronga just for a different taste. But by driving that route, you would get to know Namibia from a totally different yeah. perspective. So. And I think in terms of that last race camp that we saw, obviously with the first two, I be still my beating heart. Yeah. It is beautiful. But with that last one, we see a lot of tourists wanting to come here not for luxury, to remove themselves from luxury, to That's truly thing. experience Africa. And, and it being a, a sort of cultural uh, um, uh, place, um, I'm sure you would have, be able to talk to Herrera and mm -hmm. get their point of views about various issues. Yeah. I know that the genocide uh, thing is always an ongoing thing. And that way, meet the people, talk to them, get yeah. a different point of view. Maybe uh, they've got more to add or um, they want to listen to what you've got to say. I don't know, uh, but that way you meet the people. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Wonderful. And then in our third location for today, the Monte, Car Monte Carlo Guest House up north of Namibia. Um, as you can see there, it is close to Oshikango, kind of, east yeah. of Oshikango, kind of deal, close to Inhana. So, uh, Tuyemo Haidua visited Inhana and prepared footage of the Monte Carlo guest house. Um, this is in the Oanguena region, right close to the Angolan border, um, close to Helauna Findi, which is close to the Oshikango border post in turn. Um, and as you can see, they're absolutely gorgeous place. Um, and then let's go over to Tuyemo's footage. Yeah, just quickly, um, it, uh, this place is actually in Inana. In Inana? Yeah, so, oh, okay. so if you would drive from uh, uh, Nkurunkuru or from Rundu, let's say, past Nkurunkuru towards Hilal Nafiri or uh, go to Oshikango or whatever, or take that as your shortcut over to Ondangwa, then you would typically drive past Inana. And uh, oh. at Inana, you've also got oh. that uh, big freedom uh, memorial and all that sort yeah. of thing. So clearly Inanna is sort of preparing to, to get more guests and, and hopefully um, entertain people who want to get to know Namibia or its people once again. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Maria Joachim. I'm a supervisor at Monte Carlo Guest House. I have been working here for 10 years. So I'm here to show you our beautiful rooms and our services. So we have this room which is, which is having two beds which is twin bed. This ones we accommodate two people only. Uh, they paid 650 per night, including breakfast. And including swimming pool also for those who know how to swim. Thank you. So apart from the rooms also, we have other services like um, a dining hall and we have
here we have a swimming pool uh, which is free for the people that are booked in that are sleeping here but we judge from people that are local that are coming they pay thirty dollars per person very nice swimming pool and beach and you can see there there is a, a bar also it's only that it's closed there is a big bar for a pool bar also here you can see we have some our shower for the swimming pool and some rules when you come to swim there is some rules that you have to follow This one is 550. It's in food breakfast, and as you can see, there is a fridge, an aircon, and a TV, a gas TV, and a shower. This is our standard room. It's seven hundred and eighty dollar per night, and it's included breakfast. And as you can see, we have a TV with a DSTV, fridge, aircon. Yeah, this is what we have in our rooms. So we do have also a, a lunch. You can call us on all zero eight one seventy five one zero nine three zero landline zero six five twenty three twenty six sorry twenty six twenty three seven zero one thank you interesting and i think you made a good point while we were looking at the video now it's very important to remember if these people say dollars they actually mean namibia dollars so yes. don't think that somebody will in for his right off. mind ask for 700 us dollars for, for, for a, a night you know that um, we have those but make no mistake <laughs> but it would be a bit more luxurious that's for sure so up next we've got to the point
Yeah, right up next, we've got something more aligned to Recon Africa again, um, not to bore you, but simply because those are the pressing issues in tourism and environment at the moment. So um, this week we invited Andy Giorgio uh, for an interview to AGM. AGM being obviously Africa Good Morning, our morning show that we have each day from NMH. So um, yeah, and if you if you missed it, uh, you're welcome. To, uh, tune into our internet channel, One Up Two. Uh, just com. Google it. Yeah, one up two dot com. You will automatically see it as a Namibia Media Holdings uh, um, uh, initiative, and uh, on that you get all of our shows, also the past tourism shows. So, uh, but anyway, let's come back to the point. Andy spoke to to our people at uh, Africa. Good morning. Have a look at the interview. Now, Andy Giorgio is a campaigner and consultant for climate and environmental protection, energy policies, and further development of democratic processes. We are talking to him live in Germany. Welcome to Africa. Good morning, Andy. How are you? Good morning. Thanks for having me. I'm fine. All right. Now, the first question, your first question is going to be quite brief. In just a few seconds, tell us exactly who you are and what you do. Well, as you've already outlined, I'm a freelance climate um, and environmental campaigner. I'm based in Germany, but I work internationally and um, main focus is on fracking and anything related to gas, fossil gas infrastructure. All right. Now, Andy, in Namibia, we find that uh, all media reports that are critical of the gas and oil exploration in the Kavango area of Namibia and the Kavango River Delta in Botswana are being condemned as media, allowing international lobbyists to abuse the media outlets and promote these lobbyist aversion to fossil fuel mining. Would you agree that international lobby groups can add, um, can and would do that, or is it a, a simple case of international activists that uh, support local environmentalists and activists? From a pure personal point of view, I can only say that um, I, I was invited or asked to support local and, and national opposition. Um, and, and this is true for many people uh, that work at the international level on this issue. Um, petition was handed over to Parliament a few months ago, signed by over 40 civil society groups in Namibia. I, I personally work very closely with local and, and national groups. So yes, there is an international dimension, but it's uh, rather a supporting one than an interfering one. Uh, one last point about that, we shouldn't forget that international bodies such as the UNESCO and IUCN have also expressed deep concerns about the oil and gas development plants of Recon Africa in the region. All right, now the government and Recon Africa refuse to talk about fracking as they maintain that that was never discussed. Yet geologists say that the only manner in which you can extract any oil would be through fracking. Now tell us a little more about fracking and why Europe and the Americas have turned their backs on this process that seemed to process, sorry, it seems to promise easy access to oil at some stage. If you want to know anything about fracking and the impacts of fracking uh, over a decade roughly now, um, you should look at what's going on in North America, in particular uh, the United States and Canada. Um, and the reason why many countries in Europe have refused to move forward with fracking, actually banned fracking, has to do with um, several um, impacts of the industry as such. So it starts with a bit by bit industrialization of uh, mostly former rural areas. Then it goes on with a um, vast amount of freshwater usage. We talk about on average 19 billion liters of fresh water per well. And this can go up to billions of, of liters of fresh water in the development field. There's a risk of water contamination. Um, there's a risk of contamination for fertile lands. Um, there's public health impacts, in particular for children and women li living nearby uh, fr uh, fracking industry. Um, 
and and then lastly, this industry has a, a vast and significant impact on the increasing global warming. So there are several reasons why um, if you can prevent it and if you can prevent the first steps, you shouldn't allow the fracking industry um, to evolve and develop in your country. All right. So if you had a chance to speak to the Namibian government, what advice would you give them? Well, <laughs> um, I mean, just, just look at what's going on uh, in the world uh, with regard to the global warming crisis. Um, and the, the oil and gas development plants of RECON Africa, they belong to the past. And in actual fact, they will lock Namibia into a development that is completely past orientated and that is basically responsible for the global warming crisis that we're in. And at the same time, Namibia has vast potential for renewable energy and could become a huge and, and major green hydrogen producer for the future. And I think that any official in Namibia should think twice uh, if they should embark on, on a mission that is past orientated or rather look towards the future, which is renewable energy, green hydrogen, and, and this will definitely provide an economic boost and development for Namibia. All right, now in one of the local newspapers on the headlines today, right on the face, they're talking about Prince Harry supporting, um, you know, the stopping of Recon Africa's work. Now, when such huge um, names or brands align themselves with the cause, does it amplify the cause in a sustainable way or is it just a PR stunt that, you know, lasts for about a week or two? Well, I don't think it's a PR stunt. Uh, and in actual fact, um, What's really striking is um, if, if you speak with people about it, uh, no matter you know um, to, to which part of society they belong, they, they are shocked to hear about the plans of Rack in Africa. It, it's simply a, a no-go zone where they're operating. So no, it's, it's not a PR stunt. Um, I do think it amplifies the already expressed concerns by experts and international bodies, as I've already highlighted. Um, and, and I hope that, that more voices will pop up and, and speak up. But at the same time, I also hope that investors uh, of renewable energy companies will, will see the vast resources in Namibia and will start invest in Namibia because it's, it's easy to oppose something, but it's also very important to provide some kind of economic perspective for locals and the country as such. All right. Thank you very much, Andy, for disseminating that important information on Africa. Good morning. Thank you for having me. All right. We're just talking to Andy Georgiou, a campaigner and consultant for climate and environmental protection, energy policies and further development of democratic processes. We're focusing on the oil drilling that's happening in the Kavango region. This is still Africa. Good morning. Bringing you the news as, as it is. See you after the break. <laughs> Right, and that was Andy Georgiou. Um, the next thing that I would like to insert, it's an initiative by Rewild, um, and they have a lot to say about the Save the Okavango. There is no resource more precious than water in the Okavango River Basin, where Canadian company Recon Africa is drilling for oil and gas. Local people are concerned for their homes, their water supply, and the ecosystem that supports all life around them. Yet, the Okavango River Basin is under siege. The Okavango Delta is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and an ecological wonderland so vast it is visible from space. This region encompasses key biodiversity areas and sustains nearly one million indigenous and local people by providing clean water, food, and homes. The Okavango River Basin is home to some of the world's most threatened wildlife and the stomping grounds of the largest population of elephants on Earth. It is unclear at this time if there is even oil to find. What is clear is that building oil and gas infrastructure could increase poaching, make it impossible for animals to find food and mates, 
and destroy a wilderness Eden. If not stopped, Recon Africa is poised to pollute the waters and destroy the ecosystem which the people who live here depend upon for their very lives. The wild is for the 100%, not only those who exploit it for profit. Enough is enough. Join us to demand accountability. Together, we can save the Okavango for all wild kind. And that brings us to the end of the show. Um, I hope I wasn't boring you too much. Nice to have you on the show. Thank you. It was uh, wonderful to be here. <laughs> so up uh, next week, we'll do the same thing again. And I think by that time, Irina Marie, or Irina Marie, uh, will uh, be more relaxed about this whole thing <laughs> because uh, she admitted that she was actually quite nervous. I, I don't think the nerves are necessary. No, no, anxiety. there's no. This is a, a show where we try and relax and bring something to you from Namibia, which uh, basically shows you what a nice country we've got. Sad to, to see things like Recon Africa, but those are the realities and we, we should not put our head in the sand and just mm -hmm. forget about it. Um, so next week we'll bring you some more news, some, some more destinations. Until then, remain safe and healthy. See you next week. <laughs>